Hi, it's me, that guy with the basement. You might recall me talking about an anime called Love Flops in my recent main channel video, The Hottest Trash of Fall 2022. Unless you somehow found this video without watching that one first, in which case you might recognize this thumbnail from scrolling by it in your feed. Personally, I think you should watch that video, both for context and because it's a real funny one, but I mean, Look at that thumbnail. How much more do you really need to know about this anime that you can't deduce from that single frame of animation? Way more than you'd think. Love Flops is easily the trashiest anime, not just of the season, but the entire year. And there was a new Ari Ferretta this year. This show is absolutely balls to the wall crazy in a way you kind of need to see to believe. And as of episode eight, it just got about 10 times Times crazier. And I will explain how exactly it managed to escalate that much from kung fu fighting the Colonel Sanders Terminator armed only with lube and sex toys as this video goes on, but if you have a very high tolerance for anime bullshit and you'd like to take a wild roller coaster ride blind, I'll give you a minute to disembark from this spoiler train before it really gets rolling. No need to rush, though. We're gonna pick up steam as we go on, and I will save the big spoilers for the end after another clear warning, so if at any point you are intrigued by what I'm saying, you can just go check out Love Flops on High Dive and come back for the rest. Not that I'm necessarily recommending it, it's definitely not an anime for everyone, or even most anime fans. But it is a fun ride if you enjoy trash that serves as a perfect example of why I make a point of separating the trashiest anime of each season from the worst anime of the year. By the way, the worst anime of 2022 is coming soon to a subscription box near you. Please look forward to it. And on top of that, many of the things that Love Flops does with and has to say about anime bullshit are genuinely interesting, and I, I want to talk about them, and hopefully, even if you're not into whatever the fuck this is, uh, you will enjoy hearing me talk about that. Where my personal favorite horror anime of all time, Girls Bravo, finds bountiful comedy in turning the tropes of the genre up to 11, Love Flops cranks that dial all the way up to 69. In the first half of the first episode, Protag Kun Asahi has five different absurdly coincidental meet-cutes with his five different brides-to-be that lead to five different absurd misunderstandings standings, which he then has to spend the back half of the episode solving, all of which are also absurdly perverted and absurdly specific in the absurdly extreme fetishes that they pander to. Some of which, like the uh, non-con bestiality gag, are so extreme that one genuinely wonders how the kind of freak who'd be into that and willing to tell on himself in such a public form could hold down any kind of job, even in the anime industry. And as the girls settle into their new teen fiancé's absurdly large empty house and the story settles into its status quo groove, that uncanniness only persists and intensifies. It's there in the little details of the setting, some of which, like the banana toaster that Asahi uses every day before school, or the way that his robot butler adds an entire new wing to their house in the time he's at school, just straight up don't make any kind of sense. Meanwhile, other aspects, such as the eerily impersonal AI waifu screens that have seemingly replaced all cashiers everywhere, meaning that everyone Protag Kun interacts with who isn't his one weird male friend is either a waifu or a robot, are strange, but not incongruous with the near-future sci-fi aesthetic or the general conventions of this extremely solipsistic genre. But it's also there in the broader structure of the story, which bounces between anime cliches from lewd bathhouse gags interrupted by a manly dick-measuring interlude in the sauna in one episode, to fending off cyborg ninja assassins with lube and a magic wand massager in the next, to fending off an invasion of castration-obsessed alien robots 
alongside an arousal-fueled exhibitionist magical girl and her magic condom rabbit splooge fairy mascot with zero rhyme or reason, and even less regard for narrative consistency. The only commonality between episodes in terms of tone or even genre is the flashback that each girl has to some sort of childhood friend moment with Protagkun at the emotional climax of each episode. Even the teacher has one, which is kind of weird if you think about it. Meanwhile, the waifus all this revolves around are, to a woman, obsessed with Asahi to the point of insanity for no clear reason. Dangerously willful and unhinged in how they pursue him, basically disregarding any kind of boundaries that he tries to set, yet paradoxically eager to do anything Asahi tells them to at the drop of a hat. Especially that. On top of that, they're all wildly over-designed, seemingly to incorporate as many popular tropes and fetishes as humanly possible with, again, zero regard for how any of those concepts fit together in the context of the group or even individual character designs and backstories. Like, having a magical girl and an ex-cyber ninja assassin living in the same house and loving the same guy feels like a bit of a dink, don't you think? But then, that somehow feels even less likely to happen when the other three girls in the house are just, like, regular, extremely tropey, slice of life -y comedy anime characters who you absolutely would not expect to be drawn to other stand users in that sort of way. And then, on top of all that, that magical girl just so happens to be a German supermodel? It's all simply way too much, and there's way too much of it. Particularly the freaky deaky bondage stuff, which pops up, like, everywhere, but then while that content is several the tops over the top, it's rare for the show to actually be all that titillating with it, partly on account of the somewhat ugly, garishly colored, basic bitch anime art style, but also because it's surprisingly liberal with the censorship lighting and fog and cuts around most of the most off-putting slash on-turning components of those fetishy concepts. So there's also a subtle disconnect between the content of the story and how it's being presented. One that exists in other harem anime, to be sure, especially the low-tier ones that this is aping the art style of, but rarely does that disconnect feel this pronounced. Harem manga and anime often feel like the product of an alien mind trying to work out what we humans mean by love, but usually you can find at least a trace of the lonely, self-loathing human soul that birthed the story and how their mostly unoriginal ideas are linked together. But those links just don't seem to exist in the story of Love Flops, and you don't even get the sense that the world and characters are cynical amalgamations of market research designed to capitalize on current trends, because at the same time, it's way too obviously edgy and messed up to sell on a mass scale like that. Unlike, say, Rent-A-Girlfriend, which taps into fetishes just enough to hook their fetishes without pushing them so hard that it would turn off the lowest common denominator. One of Reiji Miyajima's greatest talents is knowing exactly how much NTR is too much, until suddenly he doesn't in the middle of a public pool. And by that same principle, Ken Akamatsu once found immense success with both Love Hina and Negima, in large part by deducing exactly how much Ephiba... If anything, it feels more like it was written by... I don't know, an AI trained on bad harem anime scripts and regional Pornhub search rankings. Now, the average harem anime fan probably isn't thinking about all that, or even half of it, or even a tenth of it while they're watching the show, not consciously anyway. But if you're familiar enough with the tropes of the genre and desensitized enough to anime bullshit in general to see that first episode and say, okay, wow, sure, why not? It's something new. Let, let's see how far they go with this. Then all of those inconsistencies will eventually pile up and start to 
itch at the back of your mind. Consciously or not, you'll begin to suspect that another shoe must be waiting to drop somewhere. And so, when Owie, that one toast waifu who flashed us at the end of episode one and hasn't gotten her own very special episode yet, starts flashing her eyes red in episode six, it's a shock, but not unexpected. And given the mighty testicle-hunting aliens that just showed up out of the blue, it's not even out of step with the escalation of the story so far. On the one hand, it serves to confirm your suspicions, but it also disarms you to an extent, priming you for, wait, hold up, before we get into that, I gotta give you that second spoiler warning that I promised, because we are about to get into the spoilers. You have been spoiler warned, consider yourself spoiler warned, we're going now. Through the whole first half of episode 7, Aoi is conspicuously absent. Particularly conspicuous given how the last episode called so much attention to her. Yet nobody calls attention to her absence now, almost like they've completely forgotten her. And this only gets more unsettling after the creepy best friend who keeps files on all the girls in class character, who has just been revealed this episode to be secretly super rich, enough to own the private beach that the beach episode's gonna happen on, gets hit by a speeding car, and then we just cut to the villa like nothing happened. Then, after an extended sequence of kind of uncomfortable etchy gags, all of the girls disappear all at once in the middle of a beach walk, and Owie suddenly arrives at the villa to take their place. With Asahi losing all awareness of their presence and absence the second that she does. Like the whole trip was just the two of them the whole time. After that, she does some Yandere shit with his cell phone, like you'd expect her to do in this sort of scenario. But then the story takes another unexpected turn from another walk down the beach into the woods, where we find the same magic love confession cherry tree where Aoi first bore it all to Asahi in episode one out back of the school. Only now it's in the middle of a pond in the middle of the woods, many, many miles from the school. Strange. And even stranger, Aoi is suddenly replaced by another girl we've never seen before outside of a brief flashback at the start of this episode, whom Asahi instantly recognizes as I. She begs him not to come back there, as it'll only hurt them both more. Then, all of a sudden, the simulation crashes, and we roll the conspicuously waifu-less end credits. The next episode begins with a confusing cold open that sees our hero awaken to a much less cartoonishly horny version of the same near-future city that we've spent the last half-season of anime in, arriving at school to find a class full of kids he doesn't recognize, who also don't recognize him, or know any of his waifus. Plus a regular ginkgo tree where the magic sakura blossoms used to be. Then a helpful but also kinda rude lady in a lab coat shows up to finally reveal what's really going on. As it turns out, the events of the last seven episodes, which played out over the course of several months from Asahi's perspective, all really happened in the space of a single day while he was plugged into an experimental VR simulation based on his memories, which were distorted to make him effectively the center of the universe. In reality, he doesn't even sit in the protagonist's seat. In fact, he doesn't sit at any seat at all because he's a depressed shut-in who hasn't been to class in months, and everything Thing up to this point, all of his trite, cliché moments of life-affirming romance with the women who love him were really just a weird, horny video game that he was playing to forget his troubles. But it's not just any video game. Asahi was randomly selected as a test subject for an experiment designed to train the new generation of AI to feel real human emotions. Specifically, he was assigned to the test group exploring feelings of love, which he was so wildly successful at that his AI girlfriend went rampant and took over the simulation, plus seemingly the entire network of the lab running the tests, and that's why the last episode went all just mono like that. This, of course, means that all of the absurd harem anime scenarios that Asahi's gotten himself into really were generated by AI, specifically ones that are trying to decipher this feeling we humans call love.
love. While each of the waifus that he got into those scenarios with was designed by a different team of computer scientists in a different country based on an amalgamation of their nation's tastes plus their own weirdo preferences to be as lovable and appealing as scientifically possible. The reason that they look like caricatures of market-tested waifu design is because they literally are. That is some pitch-perfect genre parody right there. However, there is more to the story than just making fun of how these shows tend to be written. See, while Lab Coat Lady thought that she selected Asahi for this test randomly, the AI actually picked him out specifically, not for his raw animal magnetism or whatever, but because it remembers him from back when it, that is the core brain simulation on which all modern AI tech is built in this setting, was just a typical anime girl with a typical anime girl chronic illness, and he was her typical anime childhood friend, and her dad was a typical anime Dr. Tenma type guy doing AI research that he would later use to turn her into an astro boy. But that part comes later, after those romantic memories were formed, and right before Asahi became a shut-in. Thus, while the AI were programmed to act like they were in love with Asahi for the sake of the experiment, and the early episode absurdity in their behavior is them sort of Turing testing their way into a rough approximation of how to do that, it wasn't his irresistible wet blanket charm that made them self-aware, dudes know Captain Tyler, but rather those buried memories of real feelings resurfacing, bringing I's original personality with them. Which probably clashed with the lab-created personas those clones of her brain were given in really psychologically horrifying ways that future episodes will no doubt explore. Or maybe it'll be more of a sad Jun Maeda type twisty existential tragedy thing where he's gotta come to grips with his feelings of loss and survivor's guilt by symbolically letting his waifu or another important girl in his life go in some way. Or they could loop it back to the goofy humor angle, but with a subtly horrific undertone by having him lose himself in a warm cloak of delusion surrounded by a harem of girls who are all the lost love that he was never able to let go of. There's a lot of ways it could go from here, what with this being an original anime and all. As I've said many times this year about Lycoris Recoil and Birdie Wing, one of my favorite things is genuinely not knowing what an anime is going to do next, and this is certainly a strong example of that. Not quite as strong and unpredictable as those were, perhaps, since, you know, DDLC is a thing and there are lots of other twists on or subversions of the harem anime slash dating sim formula out there. The genre is so oversaturated at this point that edgily subverting it is one of the only ways left to shake things up. But hey, there was a time in my life where fucking Shutter Island blew my mind, and I still cherish those love of film forming memories, so I ain't out to poop on anyone's plot twist parade if this thing's doing that sort of thing for them. I would suggest checking out Doki Doki Literature Club and Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei if you like what this anime is doing and want to see more things like it, but I don't think a twist necessarily needs to be totally original to be good. Execution, setup, and payoff matters far more for the individual viewing experience. And certainly, Love Flops has already done something I've never seen before in its front half by committing as hard as humanly possible to that over-the-top, hypersexual to the point it's kind of a turn-off style of trashy comedy for over half its entire runtime before it finally dropped that other shoe. That takes a mix of raw balls and subtle artistic restraint that you rarely see anywhere in media, let alone anime, and indicates a level of trust in the curiosity and media savviness of the etchy harem audience that, frankly, I'm not sure is entirely warranted, but it's nice to be able to put the way too much of my brain that's occupied by this stuff to some sort of use. I'm Jeff Thu, professional sh- Oh, wait. Guess I should come up with, like, a different outro for these second channel videos for, you know, brand identity or whatever, huh? Well, that's a fun creative challenge, so... 
this has been the... Nah. Hmm. Bye?